So here now is the master theorem. And um, initially, it's a little bit of a, a shocking, perhaps even frightening thing. It's uh, somewhat complicated. But let's go ahead and read it and, and try to understand what it's saying. Okay, so master theorem says, suppose you've got a non-negative real number A, and you have a positive real number B, and suppose you have two functions, f and t, that are continuous and monotonic. What is monotonic? Well, that, that means either increasing or decreasing. Most of the time we're thinking increasing, but uh, at least little f can sometimes be decreasing. Okay? Um, that, 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 that's a, a detail that we don't need to really think about too hard in practice. Um, and to be perfectly honest, um, this, this, the language here is a little different than the language in, in the book of Corman at all. Um, so don't be concerned about this anyway. Uh, here we go. So suppose we know that the function t spies the recurrence formula t of n equals a times t of n over b plus f of n. Okay, with that as hypotheses, there are three uh, cases to consider. Okay, if there's a constant p such that p is less than the base, the log, the base b log of a, and such that little f of n is little o of n to the pth power, then it can be asserted that capital T of n is equal to capital theta of n raised to a power. And the power is the base, the base b log of a. Okay, n raised to the base b log of a. So that's the first case. The second case says that if f of n is um, big theta n raised to the base b log of a, then it follows that capital T of n is capital theta of n raised to the base b log of a multiplied by the base 2 log of n. Okay? The last case is a little bit trickier. It asserts that if there's a constant p, that is greater than the base b log of a with f of n equal to capital omega of n to the p and if little f of n over b is less than or equal to c times little f of n for some constant c less than 1 and for all sufficiently large n then it follows that capital T of n is equal to capital theta of f of n. Okay. So that is probably, or at least possibly, causing you to be a little bit alarmed. Um, let's go back to the first case and see if we can sort of paraphrase it a bit. Okay, the idea of the first case is that the function f of n is growing f fairly slow, okay, Com um, slow enough. f of n is big O, of n raised to some power, and that power is less than the base 2 log of a. Okay, so f of n would have to be growing no faster than n to the p. Okay? Um, in that case, the analysis of the recurrence formula basically reveals that f of n doesn't have any serious impact here. Okay, it's almost, it doesn't really matter. You, you could basically set it to zero and have t of n equals a times n over b. Okay, because f of n is growing so slowly that it doesn't have any impact. The dominant term would be a times t of n over b, and the f of n would be insignificant. Okay, in that case, you wind up with t of n being capital theta of n raised to a power, the power is um, base b log of a. Okay? Um, the third case is, is the opposite. Basic, well, sort of. The third case is basically saying that f of n 
is growing very fast. It's growing at least as fast, capital omega, of n to the p. So f of n is growing at least as fast as n to the p, where p is a constant larger than the base b log of a. And then there's a technical detail that has to uh, be realized as well. But in that case, when the technical detail is true and f of n is growing fast enough, uh, it turns out that the f of n is the important part of that recurrence formula. And you essentially wind up with the idea that t of n and f of n are growing at roughly the same rate. Okay? The second bullet is, is some, somewhere is something of the middle ground. And in that case, f of n is basically growing at the same rate of growth as n raised to the base b log of a. So in that case, you get the somewhat surprising formula that capital T of n is growing at the same rate as um, the base as n raised to the base b log of a times the base 2 log of n. Okay? So we said quite a lot, but before before we completely leave this slide, I want to point out one thing. Let's let's go back to the case again where it says f of n is equal to big theta, big, I'm sorry, f of n is equal to big O of n to the p, okay? But we're assuming that p is less than log uh, to the base b of a. If you think about that for a moment, you should be able to convince yourself that, that as a consequence of f being big O of n to the p, it also follows that n is little o of n raised to the log b of a. Okay? So that's just something else to think about. f of n is little o of n to the base b log of a. So f of n is growing substantially slower than n raised to the base b log of a. Okay, so if we go back to merge sort, we can quickly observe that the merge sort recurrence formula um, is, a, is a special case of the situation in the master theorem. Um, so to make that connection, set A and B both equal to 2, and of course we have T of N is equal to 2 times T of N over 2, plus f of n, okay? But in the case of merge sort, we've said that that little f of n part is capital theta of n. We don't care precisely what that function f of n is. We only care that it is growing at a rate that is capital theta of n. It's growing at linear rate, okay? So if you check it out, the second case of the master theorem applies. And here's why. Log to the base b of a is simply the base 2 logarithm of 2, which is equal to 1. And of course, f of n is equal to capital theta of n to the first power. So the second, second case does indeed apply. And when you look at its conclusion, it amounts to saying that t of n is equal to capital theta of n base 2 log of n. So we get the formula that we expect to get. Okay, let's talk about quicksort a little bit here. The best case scenario for quicksort is the same as the best as, as the situation for merge sort. Um, you recall how this was in the best case for quicksort the, uh, the each each subarray gets divided evenly or very close to evenly um, with each uh, recurrence, okay? W with each call, um, 
So when, when that happens, the analysis for quicksort is the same as for merge sort. We have t of n equal 2 times t of n over 2 plus kappa theta of n. Why do we get the capital theta of n again? Well, in the case of merge sort, the capital theta of n part was concerned with the merging together of two already sorted sublists. But in the case of quicksort, it's concerned with locating the pivot, isn't it? Right? There's a certain amount of time required to locate the pivot in the subarray and to arrange for everything before the, before the pivot to be less equal to the pivot and everything after the pivot to be greater than or equal to the pivot. Okay, and how long does that take? Well, that takes linear time because you have to take a single pass through the subarray. And you can, you can think about that. Okay? But, you know, the upshot here is that in, in that case, in the best case for quicksort, you end up with the same recurrence relation as we have for merge sort. So there we can say in the best case, sort is also going to take capital theta n log n time. Here's a little surprising fact, and this can, this can be uh, established using the master theorem. Or, in fact, it cannot directly be uh, uh, reasoned by the master theorem, but the, but the reasoning that underpins the master theorem, the reasoning used in the master theorem can be extended a little bit to cover this case, too. And we're not going to try to prove this, but... Uh, but it is a surprising, probably a surprising claim to you that I'm going to make. We just looked at the best case scenario for quicksort, where uh, every, every time uh, a subarray gets split, it gets split into two halves that are nearly equal in length. So now I'm asking, well, what, what about the situation where every time the subarray gets split, it gets split into two halves, one of which is 99% of the original subarray, and the other is just 1% of the original subarray. So this, this has got to strike you as a very un, unlucky situation. We're being very unlucky concerning the pivot, because every time um, we're dealing with a subarray and have to hunt down a pivot and, and then arrange everything, um, and so forth. We're winding up with 99% of the stuff coming on one side of the pivot and only 1% coming on the other side of the pivot. So that seems very unlikely. Okay? And then I think you'll agree that that, that leads to this recurrence formula. In that case of being very unlucky with the 99% versus 1% split, you can say that the recurrence formula is that t of n, the time it takes to sort list of length n, would be t of 0.99n plus t of 0.01n plus capital theta of n, right? It's the time it takes to sort the, the big sublist plus the time it takes to sort the little tiny sublist plus the linear time that it required to locate the pivot and, and move things around before the recursive calls. Okay, so you look and you say, well, that's, that's likely to be uh, a, a pretty fast rate of growth. Maybe, that, maybe that'll turn out to be capital theta of n squared, like bubble sort. But the surprising thing is,